Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, here's your host, Jason Day. Welcome, friends, to the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Day, and we have a great episode for you this week as I connect all the way on the other side of the planet with Michael Frost. Mike is a well-known and influential voice in the international church, providing guidance and leadership in the missional movement worldwide. Mike is the co-founder of the Forge Mission Training Network and founding pastor of Small Boat Big C. He speaks regularly around the world and will, in fact, be joining me at the Outreach Summit here in Colorado Springs this October. We would love to meet you, and you can learn more about that at OutreachSummit.org. Mike has authored over a dozen books, and his latest, Keep Christianity Weird, is an absolute must-read. It's available this September from Nav Press. Now, on this week's episode, Mike and I discuss the important shift that is taking place in suburban life and how we as the church can best respond. Mike highlights how our churches should and should not be weird as we seek to point people to Jesus. We dig into the importance of discipleship and what it truly means to be eccentric and why it matters. So let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right into my conversation with Michael Frost. Michael, my brother from down under, welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. Good to have you with us. Hey, man. Thanks to be with you. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Yes, brother. Now, your newest book, Keep Christianity Weird. Love the title, by the way. And I want to talk about this idea of of being weird. So when we're talking to pastors, as we are uh, with the Church Leaders Podcast, you know, there are lots of churches that do some weird things. Can you talk to us a little bit, Michael, about what do you mean by uh, keep Christianity weird uh, from a pastor's perspective? What is the good kind of weird and what's maybe the not so good kind of weird? Okay, I'm really glad you started this way. Um, that it's, a, it's a great lead into what I want to talk about because when people hear, you know, let's keep Christianity weird or we need to be more weird, often that's where they go. They think about that kind of thing that you just referred to, like churches do all kinds of crazy stunts and they think that that's some kind of special form of being different to the world around them. But I think that they are just stunts. And I think that actually they come from the fact that many churches and To be frank, many suburban churches tend to be quite stultifyingly conventional. Uh, They've molded themselves to kind of contemporary suburban values, which are things like conformity and privacy and consumerism and busyness and those kinds of things. I mean, you can't help but in some way be shaped by the culture around you. And so churches can tend to, to be shaped by those kinds of Values, And then when some pastor thinks, oh, oh, hold on, we're looking a little bit too much like everyone around us. Let's let's quick. Let's do something crazy. (laughs) So, yeah, you know, we build a perspex box on the roof and the pastor has to be up there for a week praying or something or or you buy a whole bunch of dog toys and you do a kind of blessing of the animals things. And I, I think our culture sees that kind of stuff for what it is. It's a stunt. It's a. It's a PR exercise. It's a, it's a cute kind of way of getting attention, but it's definitely not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the church needs to recover its identity as an alternative, redeemed society embedded within the particular culture of which it's part, demonstrating an alternative, demonstrating there's another way, demonstrating that those suburban values I talked about before uh, you know, heightened levels of privacy and consumerism and uh, those kinds of things aren't the only way to live. Um, so sure, when we say oh, that's a little bit weird, that's usually a pejorative, it's not a good thing. But I'm trying to recover the idea of, of the notion of weird or eccentricity or being alternative as actually being like the original command of the church to be in the world, but not of the world, to be distinct and peculiar as a people, showing uh, the world that there is an alternative way. There's a different way to be human. That's good. And, and as we think of being in the world and not of the world, and this idea of an alternative community that is the church, how has the church not been an alternative community um, in recent history? Well, 
in particular in the way I just referred to then by by connecting its culture very strongly to suburban values I think it'd be the most obvious way that we've seen it happen you know cities uh, uh, went through an absolute upheaval as a result of uh, the post-war boom uh, the building of suburbs the building of freeways and roads and the obsession with the car and so uh, you know, I don't need to tell you. I don't need to tell you about how suburbs developed, but churches then went into those places, and suburbia has been a very happy hunting ground for the church, as you'll know. I mean, churches mm-hmm. have thrived right. in suburb, suburban neighbourhoods, um, and there's lots of great. I, I don't want anyone to hear me saying that all suburban churches are terrible here. Su- suburban churches have done magnificent things. They've preached the gospel. They've uh, helped people in need. They've been. Uh, um, a place where the scripture is taught, where people are cared for. So I don't want anyone to hear me saying, oh, all suburban churches are terrible. But as a natural result of being engaged in suburbia, there has been a co-opting of those kinds of values. And when you, why do people live in suburbs? They moved to the suburbs because they wanted to get away from urban centres. They wanted to not live in apartments. They didn't want to have common walls with their neighbours. They wanted a large block of land. They wanted room. Homes started to be built in that kind of McMansion style with the with the double car garage at the front and the door either at the side or like nestled nestled in you know beside the the garage so that, that, that there's no windows no life no openness at the front of the house all the light all the windows all the life happens at the back so we put big fences around those houses we built the strip mall so that you could drive in your car on your own right up virtually to the front door of the store that you want to go to i mean you can see those values uh, being shaped uh, shaping the kinds of people that live there and churches started to respond to those then so we built churches where you can turn up to a church on sunday you don't have to talk to anybody if you don't want to you can kind of just sit in the back row you can observe or participate Participate, then leave again. I mean, we respect your privacy. We respect your your desire to be left alone. Uh, churches became increasingly consumeristic, which mm-hmm. was very strongly the kind of the emergence of the baby boomer culture. Uh, and so we started to tailor ministries for people. We tried to meet their needs, respond to their preferences. Um, it's 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 obvious in all those kinds of ways that the church kind of hitched its star to the wagon of suburban values. But the struggle, Jason, I think that we're, we're now experiencing is that suburbia is actually under enormous strain. Shopping malls, for example, which are the kind of the epicenter of suburban life, are closing down. I right, mean, yeah. The, the, shopping, the shopping mall is under enormous economic threat at the moment. And maybe some listeners to this podcast might even have one that's closed down, some big hulking, empty kind of building space uh, that, that people no longer want to go to. Lots of people know that their shopping malls have various kind of stores that have just been vacant for ages. For the first time in history, uh, uh, golf, course, uh, golf courses are now closing down at a greater rate than they are being built. Golf is the fastest declining sport in America, from what I've read. A lot of the uh, a lot of the kind of suburban kind of chain restaurants now are under enormous threat. So what we're finding, of course, is I think that a couple of generations of being raised in suburbia have led a lot of people to not want those kind of suburban values we've just talked about. And there is a desire now actually to live in a neighbourhood, to know your neighbours, to be engaged closely with people around you, uh, to shop locally, to support local stores, to to uh, to uh, access produce that's uh, that's uh, been farmed or or grown in a uh, responsible manner. There's a desire for conviviality, hospitality, uh, a greater kind of connection to place emerging among people who grew up in suburbia and are saying, well, there are good things about that, but I'm wanting to find an alternative way to this. And so if nothing else, I think church leaders need to say, well, suburban life is under an enormous amount of threat here if we've hitched our start to that particular wagon and it's now kind of you know the wheels are starting to kind of loosen we need to think seriously about what it is that people are telling us they really do want out of life and i believe and one of the things i say in this book is that a lot of those yearnings that we're now seeing among younger people moving out of the suburbs are actually the very things that the gospel uh, calls us to be committed to in any case. Yeah, definitely. So we see this this shift, Michael, 
And uh, as you talk about this shift, you know, kind of, and, and we see this right here in Colorado Springs, you know, our, our uh, large shopping malls are, are closing down and everything's focusing more on, you know, downtown is growing and booming, you know, the smaller family owned restaurants and, you know, the farmer's markets, all of those types of things. Exactly what you're saying, you know, people want that kind of more of a close knit, uh, more of an authentic, you know, experience, I guess, when it comes to like all aspects of life. So all of that, that, that shift is happening and all that sounds really, really, really good for the church because it seems the church um, more naturally fits into that type of an environment than what we've seen in the past. Uh, you know, this, this idea of suburbia and, you know, drive-in churches and those types of things. So when we're talking about the, like the biblical elements of church and what it means to be the people of God, what different elements um, do you see, Michael, that are kind of coming to the forefront in kind of this shift or that we as pastors need to really be focusing in on as we see this shift taking place? Well, actually, I took a bit of a, a cue, not so much in Colorado Springs, although what you described there is happening all across America. But the kind of the first wave of this, you know, was the was cities like um, Austin, Texas and Portland, Oregon and places like that. And they actually taken as their city slogan, as I'm sure you're aware, <laughs> you know, keep Austin weird. And once you interrogate that, there is actually a, like a, a thing called the weird cities doctrine. Like what is a weird city? What does it mean for Austin to be weird or Portland to be weird or Santa Cruz or Asheville or any of those kinds of cities? And when you examine what they're saying is weird about Austin, there are a number of things. One of them is um, more responsible and creative uh, responses to homelessness. Mm. Another is like local boutique producers and, and small business. Uh, another is the fostering of and encouragement of local arts and music uh, industries. Uh, another one is an encouragement of alternative lifestyles and uh, eccentricity. Um, uh, another one of those is a desire for greater uh, responses to climate change and to the environment and to locally sourced produce. Now, I run through all of those kinds of things. I mean, uh, the Weird Cities Doctrine has got like about 15 or 16 different values that it lists. And I mean, I think that the church could quite easily sign off on most of them, to be quite honest. I mean, mm -hmm. the church may get a little bit nervous about you know, affirmation of all lifestyles and in terms of eccentricity and those kinds of things. But by and large, I mean, for the church to look at those kinds of things and say, well, that's not weird. That's actually Christian. It's Christian to want to respond to homelessness. It's Christian to actually want to respond and support local businesses. It's Christians that want to contribute to the common good. It's Christians who want to bring the values of justice and reconciliation and beauty and wholeness and healing, all the things that Christians have been committed to for centuries, uh, these are the very things that cities like Austin or Portland or others are now, like they're crying out for. But what, what I would say in response to that is that even though Austin and Portland and in your case, say Colorado Springs are saying, well, hey, here we are, we're, we're going to be weird and that weirdness is going to be about the common good. We also know that these cities aren't like really killing it, right? So you know, there, there is a real gentrification issue happening in these cities. There is kind of white, rich suburban people moving into uh, traditionally black or Hispanic or Asian communities, and there's a lot of dislocation occurring. Uh, there's um, the hipsterization of culture. There's uh, um, what's now emerging as what's been called the, the food mirages, a lot of kind of urban communities we used to talk about them having uh, food deserts because there were no like supermarkets or stores nearby. But now there's a whole bunch of them all around what were traditionally kind of urban or poorer neighborhoods. But people who live there can't afford to shop in these kinds mm. of places. So, so what I'm saying is like cities, America is saying we want these values of justice and reconciliation and beauty and wholeness. We're going to try and, and, uh, and inculcate them in our city. They're not doing it perfectly by any means. Surely this is an opportunity for the church to say, hey, we're kind of weird like that. We're the original weirdos. Like, 
We, we actually know what these values should look like. Hey, can we help you? Can we support you? Can we move into the cities with you and contribute to this in some way, rather than just hunkering down in, in suburbia? Now, when I talk to pastors about this, I, I acknowledge there are lots of very happy suburban people that still need to be ministered to in the suburbs and still love those values of privacy and and. Uh, and consumerism and, and things like that. So you, you've got to be where people are and you've got to minister to them and try and direct them to biblical values in those contexts. But I also want to say I think that the future is going to be weirder and we need to get back to our original values. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Now, how does the idea of discipleship play into this these weird values for the church? Yeah, you're asking some great questions because this is totally a discipleship issue because if being weird is just a matter of style, then it's no different to what we've done before, right. is it? It's just like right. homogenous homogenous white churches, homogenous black churches, homogenous you know, Asian churches in the suburbs. I mean, if we're just now going to say, well, we're going to be in the city and we're all going to grow beards and get tattoos and become baristas. <laughs> To me, it's just homogenous. It's just a different kind of style. Right. Um, and discipleship is not a matter of style by any means. And so one of the things I say in the book is that, uh, you know, another word for weird would be the word, I've used it a couple of times already, it would be the word eccentric. Mm. And the word eccentric, the root words for that are, are the terms off-center. So an eccentric person is one who is kind of off-center. And one of the things I, I interrogate in the book is the way in which eccentricity is often at the source or at the heart of a lot of experimentation and innovation. Eccentric people actually kind of crack open new possibilities in lots of ways. And one of the things I say is, well, we always think eccentric people are just kind of, you know, wired that way. But when you think about the notion of being off center, one of the things I say is that is fundamentally Christian, that what we believe is that when we accept Christ as our king and as our savior, we abdicate the center of our own identities in a mm. way. We abdicate the center of our ego. We step aside, as it were, within ourselves, and we put Christ at the center of our lives. We say Christ is at the heart of my ego and my understanding of life and my identity. I now become off center to him as the center of my life. So one of the things I say is, well, discipleship, it's actually about equipping people to be legitimately and biblically eccentric. Uh, we don't disciple people to fit in. I've heard people actually say, hey, listen, you know, go out there, talk about Jesus, but don't be weird about it. <laughs> We're discipling people not to be weird. We're discipling people to say, well, fit in, look like everyone else, uh, you know, conform, and then talk about Jesus in the midst of that. But I would say, that actually, we should be discipling people not to fit in. We should be discipling them to be off-center people. We ought to be odd, intriguing, peculiar, curious. And I think that that's not a matter of style. It's not a matter of buying a whole bunch of, you know, dog toys and uh, putting <laughs> on a special service. I think that's actually about... From the very beginning, discipling people to be alternative. One of the one of the um, uh, books that I refer to uh, in my book is Alan Crider's book, The Patient Ferment of the Church, which refers to the early church's processes of catechism and training. And one of the things he says there is that. You know, they didn't. They, the early church did not baptize you like five minutes after you made a profession of faith. They took you into what could have been almost like a 12-month process of catechism, uh, during which you were taught and equipped and trained and disciplined to become an off-center person, to put Christ at the heart. Uh, only after then would you be baptized and become a member of the church. So it was kind of like, hey, listen, we need you to be weird and you can't pull that off in five minutes. So <laughs> submit yourself to this process and we will equip you to be the alternative person that the Roman Empire needs uh, so that we can glorify God through that. So I, I think it's the same story, man. We just need to disciple people 
not just to, to fit in, but like maybe have a few slightly different values, like we don't have sex before we're married or, uh, you know, we, we don't drink too much or something like that. But other than that, just look like everybody else, spend money the same way everyone else does, go on the same vacations they go on, laugh at the same jokes, watch the same television programs, just look exactly like everybody else, build the same houses, uh, buy the same kinds of cars, fit in and then say to people, hey, we have an alternative way, follow us. Well, no wonder nobody's buying it. Yeah, it's, there's not too much of an alternative whenever it looks just the same as, as everything else. Exactly. Right. So, Michael, what um, if, if you're, as we are, talking to a pastor, let's say you're sitting down over a, a cup of coffee with a pastor, and he resonates with this message, you know, and, and, and he's saying or she is saying, hey, Michael, practically speaking, practical steps, what would you recommend – I, you know, begin doing over the next week or the next months or the next few months as a pastor to help, you know, navigate this and help lead my, my people, the people God's entrusted to me into this weirdness. Oh, uh, am I allowed to say that they should buy like a hundred copies of my book and hand it out to everyone in their congregation? Is that, is that, <laughs> that's, that's a legitimate that too, start there. Yeah. Is that too consumeristic <laughs> for me? I mean, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that's in fact, in fact what the kind of the book is about. Like what kind of uh, values are we wanting to inculcate within our congregations? And one of the first steps in that is the process of unlearning. And so a lot of the things that we've just talked about, Jason, people just unconsciously live out. They're, right. they're, they're, not, they're not conscious of it. They're not saying, oh, I just put an eight-foot fence around my house because, you know, um, I, I want to be private and separate they just did it because that's what everyone in the in the housing division did you know so uh, there's a there's an unconsciousness about like living where we live and shopping where we shop and doing the things that we do so i think there needs to be a process of of unlearning and so of uncovering and examining kind of what kind of values are shaping us um you know, there, there is, of course, in America, a very strong uh, orientation around sort of hot button ethical issues. Um, we all know what those are. And I'm not suggesting you abandon any commitments to teaching and uh, equipping people around those issues. But I would have thought that we also need to start to do a serious examination of suburban values, of the history of suburbia, how we got to where we got to, and then a, an equally important examination of what then are the values of the kingdom of God. I mean, I don't think the mission of God's people is to grow God's church. And I know pastors like Blanche when I say that, but I don't <laughs> think that that is the purpose of the church, to grow itself. The purpose of the church is to alert others to the reign of God, to glorify God, to point people to the magnificent kingdom, the reign of King Jesus that's unfurling around us and throughout the world and throughout history. And now I think when we do that well, people will want to participate in that kingdom. They will want to put themselves off center, make him the king of their world, follow him and the church will grow. But church growth, in my view, is like a secondary or tertiary outcome of what the church ought to be doing. We're going to be equipping people to understand what is the kingdom of God? What does that look like? I mean, for Pentecostals, the kingdom of God is speaking in tongues and uh, and praise and worship. But, you know, for progressives, it's a bit of social justice. Uh, uh, for evangelicals, the kingdom of God is, uh, is uh, uh, promoting kind of um, certain ethical values. But... I would say that, you know, the kingdom of God is actually the world as Jesus anticipated it should be. It's the yearning that Israel had before Christ, the incarnation. It's all that Jesus talks about. It's about a completely upside down world in which everything is transformed. I mean, it's fundamentally different to the world of which we part of which we grow up. So unlearn the world that we're part of. And then teach people what does the reign of God look like. I've I've tried this little exercise in a few different places, Jason, where mm -hmm. I say to people, "Can you tell me uh, what is the gospel?" And in most churches, people have a pretty good shot at explaining that. They, you know, they, some get it better than others, but generally they'll talk the gospel. Oh, it's about Jesus dying for my sins, and about them we need to repent and give our life to Jesus. Something along those kinds of lines. They, they, they usually have something to say. Mm -hmm. But then when I say to them, oh, okay, now can you tell me what is the reign of God or what is the kingdom of God? Can you, could you describe that to me? 
people people stop. They pause. They have to think. Um, they they kind of stammer out some answers eventually. But it occurs to me, if our job is to alert the world to the reign of God, and we've got churches full of people who don't know what the reign of God looks like, they can't explain it or describe it or show people. Then maybe we're in big trouble, aren't we? Yeah, you know it's um. It's interesting because as we kind of process through that, um, you know, culture, as you've said, plays such a big part. And and uh, here here in the U.S., the culture, kind of the political climate, um, where the church sits within that, um, what does it look like to be an evangelical or to call yourself an evangelical? You know, all of that has has been stirred up to a very great degree here in recent history. I'm curious, Michael, from from someone outside of the U.S. and a brother in Christ, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the church and how the church has to be careful when it comes to aligning itself uh, maybe too closely, you know, in these kind of political arenas? Can you talk a little bit about that and how that plays into this idea of the alternative community, this keeping Christianity weird? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 not weird at all to align yourself with one party or another. Everyone. Mm has done it, everyone. I mean, my country is not that different to yours. I mean, um, you know, we have a two, ma- a two major party system. I mean, ours is very similar to, say, Canada or, 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 uh, or Great Britain. So we can be infected by the same kind of thing. But it does, uh, I take your point, it does seem to have reached fever pitch in America these days. And it feels as though people are saying, well, if we don't get this right, if we don't elect the right party or the right president, everything is going to go to hell in a handbasket. Mm-hmm. It's like this is our hope. Our hope is to mm-hmm. get this right at this point. And I, I certainly think Christians ought to be involved in political processes, just as I think Christians ought to be involved in in business and the arts and, and education. I mean, Christians ought to infiltrate every aspect of society, every, every strata of, of culture and make a contribution for the kingdom. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that we completely, I'm not totally a hardcore Anabaptist saying we should completely withdraw an epox on both their houses. I'd say we engage at that level like we do in every other, any other aspect of culture. But here's what I would say. We do not put our hope in politics to usher in the kingdom of God. Mm. There is no way any political party, any politician, any presidential candidate is going to deliver the reign of God to us. And we really ought to be able to say, no matter who's elected, uh, I am confident that King Jesus is ushering in this kingdom, that he is at work in this world, that he is bringing about the conditions for his return when we will see that kingdom utterly, totally and completely. But in the meantime, we are participating in the unfurling of that kingdom, even though it's fitful and partial and mysterious in this present era. Our hope is in Christ bringing about this world in the here and now, as well as in the age to come. Uh, I don't expect my president to have to deliver that to me. Mm, That's good, brother. Good word there. You know, Mike, it's been so good um, talking with you. We could we could sit here for hours. Um, of course, we don't have that much time. So uh, before we take off, Michael, uh, a couple things. One, how can pastors and ministry leaders who are listening in today connect with you? How can they learn more about your newest book, Keep Christianity Weird, and about uh, what you're doing as far as uh, ministry? How can they connect? Uh, they can visit my website, which is mikefrost.net. But in terms of wanting the book, they could just Google that book and buy it from their favorite online booksellers or any of those kind of places. Uh, It's published by Nav Press and Nav Press Tyndale. You can go to their website. In fact, there's a there's a bunch of resources and stuff there that are connected to the book and they can order the book there as well. But uh, uh, yeah, I I mean, we haven't got to talk about this. I know we've got to wrap up soon, but some of your listeners might be familiar with a previous book of mine called surprise the world which gave uh, a whole bunch of missional practices that our churches could embrace it's been incredibly successful and popular kind of book it's a very practical 
here are some ways in which we can disciple people into this. And so Keep Christianity Weird is kind of a companion piece to that. It's kind of basically saying, okay, start to build in those practices I talk about in the first book, and now here's a broader perspective on what that looks like culturally and in our society. So another little tip if people are interested in exploring more is to uh, to get hold of Surprise the World uh, as well as Keep Christianity Weird. Oh, yeah, definitely. And Surprise the World is is – you know, one of those books that I know myself and many other pastors have, have read and taken to heart. So definitely check out Surprise the World and then Keep Christianity Weird. One of the things, Mike, that I love about Keep Christianity Weird, um, the book is that you have some exploratory questions at the end of each chapter. So um, whether you're going through this, you know, on your own or perhaps you're taking your, you know, leadership team through it um, or your volunteers or small group study or whatever it might be, um, there's some good reflection and kind of digging in on those questions. I certainly appreciated those as I read through it. So I uh, really want to encourage you guys to check out um, Surprise the World and then Mike's newest book, Keep Christianity Weird. Some great things. It was a great conversation with you, brother. We appreciate all you're doing. And oh, uh, Thank you. God bless you, my friend. And you. Thanks for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Great questions. That was a great interview. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us on this week's episode. Every week as we are putting the episodes together, we're thinking of you, our pastors and ministry leaders, and striving to provide insightful and inspiring interviews as you seek to grow as a kingdom leader. So we hope you're finding value from the Church Leaders Podcast, and if so, we'd certainly appreciate you taking a few moments to head over to iTunes and leave us a review. Your positive reviews and ratings help other church leaders more easily find our podcasts so they too can benefit from these interviews. Again, we thank you in advance, and if you have any comments, any questions, suggestions, or ideas for guests, I would love to hear from you. You can send me an email to podcast at churchleaders.com, or you can connect with me on Twitter. Finally, you can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app. It's available for both Apple and Android, and so we encourage you to check that out as well. So until next time, this is Jason Day encouraging you to love well, and lead well. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.